<laughs> All right, let's pray. Father, in Jesus' name, I pray for your presence. Give me unction. Give me the gift of teaching. Our Father, give the folks ears to hear and a heart to receive what's said tonight. We need your presence, Lord. We need your spirit. God, we need your word. We pray this now in Jesus' name and amen. All right. If you'll turn the book of Exodus with me tonight, please. Chapter number 15, verse 23. The book of Exodus 15, verse 23. Exodus chapter number 15, verse number 23. Last Sunday, I preached a message to you about how the Lord delivered Israel from Egyptian bondage and how he led them across the Red Sea and how he delivered them from the hand of Pharaoh. And they looked back and saw the armies of Pharaoh covered completely by the waters of the Red Sea. I believe that the children of Israel went across on dry ground, and I believe that the waters congealed on either side of them, and they were as high, 100, 200, 300, 400 feet, depending on how deep it was in that area. I do not believe for one moment it was the Sea of Reeds that the liberals teach, which is much further to the north, and would have been no miracle at all, because if they got across, why well, Pharaoh's army could have gotten across. But what happened in the Bible was a miracle because God... All night blew an east wind, dried the ground, and he put a wall of fire between Israel and the Egyptians. Then the next morning, they went across. And uh, so uh, when they got to the other side, they looked back and saw the armies of Pharaoh uh, covered with water, and they drowned in the bottom of the Red Sea. You can find chariots right now buried in the bottom of the Red Sea. They're there. Uh, it's not to the purpose of a liberal or a... Uh, a Bible denier to tell you that, but they're there nonetheless. The chariots are at the bottom of the Red Sea, just like the Bible said they would be. As a matter of fact, it's quite a study to find out all the things archaeology is finding. Every time the spade goes into the ground, it digs up another proof that the Bible's true. They have never found anything, folks, that would ever cast one moment of doubt on the Word of God, on the historicity of the Scripture. But anyway, once they'd crossed over, God had delivered them. He had redeemed them. These were, these, these were people that had been carried out by the mighty hand of God. They knew that the Lord God had done it. I mean, anyone that watches a Red Sea open up and then come back together again after they'd walked across, I've never seen anything like that in my lifetime. But it happened, and I believe it happened exactly the way the Bible said it did, and I believe Cecil B. DeMille, a Jew who made the Ten Commandments, uh, I think he stayed about as close as you could to the Bible. I believe what he depicted there of Israel crossing over and those waters, it shows them on either side. I believe that's the way it happened. But in any event, once they cross over, now they are redeemed people. And I told you how last time I preached how that God built a tabernacle, a place for them to worship, come before the Lord and give Him thanks and praise because of what He'd done for them. But now they've got to live. And so that's what I'm going to talk about tonight. You've got to live. You see... Once you've been delivered from the land of bondage, you have to live. You have to occupy this world till he comes. You've got to spend your sojourn here until you're taken out of this world. So how are you going to do it? Well, you do it by faith. The Bible said the just shall live by faith. God's chosen that method because God is honored and glorified by faith. And faith cometh by hearing and hearing by the word of God. God gives us the faith we need. God blesses that faith. God increases that faith. God anoints that faith, and that faith in return gives glory to God. We are not the source of our faith. But he says that the trying of your faith being much more precious than of gold that perishes. So we know that there's a reason for God dealing with mankind the way he does. So let's start reading in Exodus chapter 15, verse 23. And when they came to Marah, they could not drink of the waters of Marah, for they were bitter. Therefore, the name of it was called Mara. That's the Hebrew word for bitter. If you'll remember, Naomi said, Don't call me Naomi anymore, but call me Mara, for the Lord hath dealt bitterly with me. And the people murmured against Moses, saying, What shall we drink? Notice carefully, we have a sin right off the bat. They're murmuring against Moses. Even though they'd been delivered from bondage, saw a wondrous miracle, yet they're murmuring. And he cried to the Lord, and the Lord showed him a tree which when he had cast into the waters, the waters were made sweet. There he made for them a statue and an ordinance, and there he proved them. 
and said, If thou wilt diligently hearken to the voice of the Lord thy God, and wilt do that which is right in his sight, and wilt give ear to his commandments, and keep all his statutes, note carefully, I will put none of these diseases upon thee which I have brought upon the Egyptians, for I am the Lord that healeth thee. There's a certain controversy as to exactly how the death angel smote the Egyptians that night when he came through. No one is specifically sure. We know God did it. We know the death angel did it. There's no question about that. But did he smite them with a plague? Or did he just simply stop their hearts from beating? Or what? We don't know. But we do know they died. And we know here in Exodus 15, 26, he says, I will bring none of these diseases upon you that I brought upon the Egyptians. So the Egyptians were, uh, were, were, uh, were, were in infected with diseases. And it's quite an ironic thing because the Egyptians considered the Hebrews to be filthy people. The Egyptians were big on washing themselves and shaving themselves. And they went about long rituals of making sure that they were clean. And you know what the Egyptians did when they embalmed one of their pharaohs and people who could afford it of higher stature in the land. So God turned it on them. And he said, I'm going to bring plagues upon you that are an indication of filth. I'm going to judge you and bring diseases upon you. And he did. He did. But he said, if you'll keep my commandments and do that which is right in my sight, I will bring none of these diseases upon you. Simply live for God in the Old Testament. Keep his commandments. You never have to go to a hospital or to a doctor. Don't have to worry about HMOs and health insurance and any of the rest of it inflation and all of that, you'll be okay. You'll never get sick. And throughout the history of Israel, when you trace it and find out sickness and plagues and so forth, you'll find they come as judgment from God upon his people. Now, don't, don't get mixed up. I'm talking about the plagues and judgments of God upon people who are under, a, under the oath and the covenant of God, where he promised, if you'll keep my covenant, I will bring none of these diseases upon you. Don't ever let anybody take you to the Old Testament promise and covenant of God with Israel and tell you that if you have a disease today, it's because you're, right, you're not right with God and God's judging you. That has nothing to do with today. This was a covenant that God made with Israel then, not now. Even in the time of the Apostle Paul, he carried a physician with him. He said, Luke, the beloved physician, from place to place, we find sickness and illness, disease and so forth all over the New Testament for various reasons. The only reason I mention that is because a lot of people try to jerk stuff out of the Old Testament and make it apply to the New Testament when it does not apply and then bring you under a guilt complex, make you feel like there's something that you should have done and it has nothing to do with that. If you notice these waters were bitter, bitter waters. We don't know what made them bitter, but they're bitter. And you notice what he, not what he said to do? He said, cast a tree into the waters. A tree is a picture of what the Lord Jesus Christ hung on when he died on the cross. The tree represents his humanity. And a tree made the waters sweet. It's the death of Jesus Christ cursed for us that gave a sweetness to this life. They wouldn't be here because it would be all bitterness. But his, his death on the cross, cursed is everyone that hangeth upon a tree. It changed it for us, didn't it? It certainly did. It's the life that we knew that was lived 2,000 years ago. We know he was here. We know he breathed like we breathe and walked where we walk and ate what we ate and lived where we lived, suffered like we suffered, got tired like we get tired. It adds a sweetness to life because if the Son of Man can do that, if God can come down and live where we are as we are, yet without sin, sinless, but if he can live where we are, then he can understand it and he can, come and he can, and he can give us the strength that we need to go through this world. Now, I want to call your attention to what's important here tonight that I want to talk to you about. In verse number 25, he cried to the Lord and the Lord showed him a tree, which when he cast in the waters, the waters were made sweet. There he made for them a statue and an ordinance, and there he proved them. God is good at this. There he proved them. There he tried them. There he tested them. There's a number of reasons for God doing that. Sometimes he'll do it to humble you. In Deuteronomy chapter number 8 and verse 2 he said, And thou shalt remember all the ways which the Lord thy God led thee forty years in the wilderness to humble thee and to prove thee 
and to know what was in thine heart, whether thou wouldst keep his commandments or no. You see, he's not, at, he's not doing this so he will find it out. He's doing it so you will know it. That the trying of your faith, faith that has never been tried, is only a willful thought or an idea. See, it's an abstract idea. It's, it's a, it's a good-sounding thing. Faith must be tried in order for it to be real. Otherwise, there's no faith to it. That's what saving faith is about. You put your faith in the Lord Jesus Christ. Bless the name. And by putting your faith in the Son of God, you are saved by believing on the Lord Jesus. Then you're tried. And I'm going to tell you this right now, tonight. Make no mistake about it. If you've ever been born again, I don't care where you go, what you do, how far you may drift from the Lord, that faith will never leave your heart. It'll always be there. That ember may be just, may be no more than a smoking flax, may be no more than a bruised reed, but it'll be there. There is no indication in the Bible where they lose their faith. Faith that is genuine is faith that, it, faith that is real and faith that is forever. So he humbled them. <clears throat> he proved them. And he did this to test them. Uh, testing of your faith also is done to strengthen you. In Exodus chapter number 20 and verse 20, he said, And Moses said to the people, Fear not, for God is come to prove you, and that his fear may be before your faces, that ye sin not, to strengthen you, to try you, to prove you, to test you. You say, well, now, preacher, I'm not so sure I've got saving faith. I wouldn't do it in here, but I would say to you, well, why don't you just curse Jesus Christ then? You say, hold on, I can't do that. Well, the Bible says, no man speaking by the Spirit of God called Jesus Christ accursed. And there are people in this world who will curse him at a heartbeat. And have no problem with it. And yet they say they're Christians. No, they're not. There's some acid tests you can put yourself to. And that's one of them right there. A true Christian will not curse Jesus Christ. You won't do it. Not with the Holy Ghost in your soul. You won't do it. You may hear them curse him all the time. But you're not going to do it. You're going to have to be in bad, bad shape for that to happen. God will test you to see if you'll obey him. In Exodus chapter number 16, verse 4, Then said the Lord to Moses, Behold, I will rain bread from heaven for you, and the people shall go out and gather a certain rate every day, that I may prove them, whether they will walk in my law or no. It's when you walk in his law, when no one knows it, that it matters. Not as a man pleaser. Not as being part or being accepted in some group. But when you do that in secret, that has far more power to it than that which is done in open. Exactly. And he said, I will prove you whether you will obey me or not. I hope you don't change when you come into the church house. I hope the same person that came in here tonight is the same person that will go home tonight. You should live a kind of life where it makes a difference to you if somebody's following you around or listening to your conversation. You should not be a type of person that, that's hiding, sneaking. Because if you are, then you are not walking in faith and obedience to God. The Lord Jesus said, everything I did, I did openly. Everything I did, I did it openly. You, you accuse me of sedition. Barabbas is guilty of sedition, not me. I didn't try to overthrow Pharaoh or, or uh, Caesar. I told you one day to render to Caesar that which is Caesar's. So if you live in the, in the state of California... Let's just bring that up tonight, okay? If you live in the state of California, the governor of California told you he's going to take your children when they're four and five years old and teach them uh, sodomy's all right and he's going to indoctrinate them to that. Is, does Caesar have right to do that? You render to Caesar that which is Caesar's. Remember that. You won't beat that. You'll never beat that. That's the wisdom of God. So he sees if you will obey him. He tests you to see... Not if you obey, if that you will obey him, but he will try you to refine you. I will bring the third part through the fire and will refine them as silver is refined and will try them as gold is tried. They shall call on my name 
and I will hear them. I will say it is my people, and they shall say the Lord is my God. A refiner's fire is to purify. Don't be afraid of the fire. When Hananiah, Mishael, and Azariah went into that furnace, the only thing that burned were the bonds that hold them together. That's all it burned. Not even much as a hair was singed. Not an eyebrow. The fire won't bother you. When you go through the fire, it'll purge you. That means that any fire of hell this earth offers up to you can only make you better. Can only purify your faith. It'll only make you better. And Satan cannot take your soul. You're sealed with the Holy Ghost till the day of redemption. Amen. We need to grow some, don't we? We all start out as babies. Some of us end up as babies. <laughs> some grow a little bit in the meantime. Mature a little bit down the way. As you mature, you're able to help others. You're able to reach out in comfort with the same comfort you've been comforted with. You're able even to get to the point as a mature Christian where you can restore another brother or sister that has fallen by the wayside. You'll find that to be a unique ministry. Only one in a thousand will be the kind of Christians that can truly restore a fallen brother or sister. To me, that's probably the, that the greatest point of Christian maturity is that one who's able to restore. But all along the way, you find Christians in various stages of growth. You say, well, I think I'm pretty, I think, I, I think I'm pretty mature and I'm, I'm pretty settled in my... You'll find out how mature and settled you are. God will see to it that you do. Don't worry about it a bit. He's a good God. He'll bust your bubble if he needs to and bring you back down to reality and let you take a good look at yourself and say, well, I was a baby's hind end, wasn't I? <laughs> yeah, I wasn't near as mature as I thought I was. That's what refining is about. The work of the Holy Spirit is to form Christ in us and kill us. Wouldn't it be wonderful the day that I leave from this old world that all I can think about is Jesus Christ and not even give a thought about my last breath? That's what it's about. Christ is formed in me. Amen. That's what it's about. It's not about me. It's not how great I am. And if I leave, how wonderful I am, what I've become, I haven't done anything. The only thing that's ever been accomplished through you, he did it most of the time in spite of you. Used you in spite of yourself. Amen. And say, boy, you don't pump us up here. No, the Holy Ghost will. The right way. <laughs> he tests his people in order to judge them and reward them. Every man's work shall be made manifest, for the day shall declare it, because it shall be revealed by fire, and the fire shall try every man's work of what sort it is. You know the baptism of fire. You know what that is. Uh, you, a young man's trained in combat, goes through military uh, boot camp, and then he goes off into, into, the milit into, the, into combat, and first thing you know, it's, it's nothing like he ever thought it would be. There's no glamour out there. You know, there's no glory out there. The bullets are flying around you and men are dropping dead around you. And first thing you realize is, I'm either going to live or die. I may not make it out of here. That's a baptism of fire. But it does something to you. It does something to you that nothing else can do to you. It just does something to you when you've been through the baptism of fire. Now, I've never been in combat, but I've been in the baptism of fire. I've been through it in different ways. Been through it. Thank God. He's a good God. I don't know what you're going through tonight, but He'll take you through it. He will. And one of the reasons for that is that He's preparing the judgment seat of Christ. And His judgment is pure judgment. Not man's judgment. Don't worry about it. Don't worry, don't worry about who you pleased and who you made mad. The judgment seat of Christ is, be, is the judge of the Lord Jesus Christ. And He judges righteous judgment. He'll judge you according to the opportunities you had. He'll judge you according to the maturity you had and how mature you should have been. He'll judge you according to the way people have treated you, the way you've treated other people. He'll judge you according to a righteous standard. And He'll do that now by the work of the Holy Spirit. He does it in your heart. He doesn't want to turn you loose and say, now live out 30 years, do the best you can, get the judgment seat, I'm going to judge you. No. When you're saved by the grace of God, the Holy Ghost will start working in you right then. He will keep you from a lot of problems and mistakes, mess-ups. He will. He wants you to be able to stand at the judgment seat of Christ and receive rewards. He that hath begun a good work in you will perform it. 
He intends for God to be glorified through you. He doesn't want you to fail. He doesn't want you to fall. That's Satan's work. And he's subtle too. Satan will come at you in 10,000 different directions from every way imaginable. He'll come at you with a holy appearance. He'll come at you with dirt. He'll come with you with, with, he'll come at you with high sounding with theology and he'll come at you in the gutter. He'll come at you with people that look to be like, appear to be your friends. He'll come at you with people who you know are your enemies. He'll come at you, but that's okay. The Lord hadn't left you. Once you've seen all of his faces, then you get to where you recognize him, don't you? How many of the faces of Satan have you seen? You learn. You grow. You grow. The judgment seat of Christ is for rewards, and he wants to reward you. All those crowns that are talked about in the New Testament are talked about because he wants to give these crowns. Then he tests you to see if you genuinely trust him. In John 5, John 6, he said, When Jesus then lifted up his eyes and saw a great company come to him, he saith to Philip, Philip, whence shall we buy bread that these may eat? And this he said to prove him, for he himself knew what he would do. Do you trust him? Oh, I trust the Lord, glory to God. Well, you'll know if you trust him when everything's gone. You'll know you'll trust him when you can't figure it out. You know you trust him when you come face to face with death. And I mean really come face to face with death and had just as soon die as live and put your life into his hands and say, Lord, here I am, live or die. And trust him with your life. Some folks will trust him with their pocketbook, but they won't trust him with their life. There's a lot of people in here that will trust me to the Lord, but they wouldn't trust themselves to the Lord. <laughs> trust your neighbor, you know. A lot of folks don't have any trouble at all praying, up, praying about their neighbor's sins. I mean, they can name a list of <laughs> all that their neighbor's done wrong, you know. <laughs> Got good eyesight. But when it comes to self, it's different, isn't it? It's so easy to criticize somebody if, you, if, you, if it appears like they're faltering. And, they, and their faith is not standing up. You know, you, have you ever heard this uh, say, well, they can't take anything? Well, you'll, you'll be able to prove whether you can or not. Life has that about it, doesn't it? You know, when you're 17, 18, 20, 25 years old, you bark all that stuff out. You get up to 60 years old, you realize life's got a lot to dish out. And all that stuff you barked out about somebody else starts coming home. And all these people that couldn't take anything, you find out, I'm going to have to take it. And you'll find out that uh, life does that. Life can get rough. It can get real rough. And the Bible said, He knoweth them that put their trust in Him. That's quite a thing. I pastored for 30 years before that ever happened to me. When I got to the point to where I trusted Him with my very life. My life. I trusted Him with my soul. And I trusted Him to save me. I trusted Him with the ministry. And I trusted Him with my family. I trusted him with all kinds of things, but it got down to my life. Live or die. It did. I said, here it is. Live or die. My life's in your hands. I just gave it to him. I trusted him with my life. You know, it seems like that's the, that's the basis for the rest of it, isn't it? Because I know at that point everything turned around. Everything got better. Have you ever trusted him with your life? You ever thought you were going to die? Did it scare you to death? Are you afraid of death? Don't be afraid of death. Christian never dies anyway. He that liveth and believeth in me shall never die. I've had a number of times where I thought I may be leaving this world. Didn't even get excited. It just bothered me for the few left behind that, that would miss me. But as far as me is concerned, see you later, alligator. <laughs> Away we go. Folks, listen, you're going to leave here. If the Lord Jesus doesn't come back in the next 20, 30 years, most of us will be gone, except for these little ones coming up. And I've learned that when you leave this old world, it has a great deal to do with your testimony, the way you leave. The way you leave. The way you leave. Folks, I've seen people scared to death 
I've seen them scared to death. And, uh, you know, it's sad. You try to do what you can to help. I've seen unsaved people, man, go into that hour, and, boy, they start denying it. They deny. Oh, they deny they're going to die. They deny it. They don't want to face that. that. That's just not part of the program. I mean, that's the part that the unsaved cannot handle because that is out of control, and that's the unknown. That's rough. I've seen a lot of unsaved people go in and pray with them, come down the hour of death, and when they're just simply unconscious, they're just out, you know. There's nothing you can do there. But boy, have I talked. Man, I have talked to Christians, though, time and time and time again. A warm smile come over their face and say, Preacher, let me tell you what I've seen. Just as calm and peaceful. Just like, just like going from one house to the next house. No sweat. No big deal. Tell the folks I love them. See you later. Meet you on the other side. Talk about a beautiful city. Talking about loved ones come back to see them. That's somebody that's put their life in his hands and they trust him. They trust him. I don't know if I lay my head down tonight, folks, if I'll ever raise it up again in this world. I don't know. But I'll crawl in that rack, pull the covers up over me and lay my head down and say, see you tomorrow. And that's it. That's it. That's what Brother Maloney did, didn't he? I'll never forget him. He's something else. A lot of you didn't know him, but he loved the Lord. He did. He loved the Lord. He loved people. He just crawled in a rack one night. Pull the covers up. That's it. <laughs> Could you think of a better way to go? That's it. He's gone. He's gone. Precious in the sight of the Lord is the death of his saints. Amen. Amen. <laughs> Amen. So, he knows them that put their trust in him. God will test us so that we'll learn more and be patient. I'll close with this tonight. Patient. My brethren, count it all joy when you fall into divers temptations, knowing this, that the trying of your faith worketh patience. The most impatient place on earth is Broadway. <laughs> <laughs> Power went out in South Florida yesterday. Did you all see that? Miami, Florida, the, all the lights, all the red lights just went out. That was a madhouse. Miami's a big town. People trying to get home from work. No red lights. <laughs> yes, sir, boy, running over each other and wiring each other out. Patience. Tribulation worketh patience. Patience. A patient person is a wise person. Well, I'll tell you right now, and I'll tell you the truth, to be honest with you, there have been so many times I didn't have any patience. I had no patience. Got myself in trouble a few times because I didn't have any patience. Did. I used to be a real hothead when I was young. Got myself in fights, messes. Man, I'm telling you, just because you didn't have any patience, you know. Get out of my way. Shut up. Do this. Do that. You know. Somebody else tell me the same thing. Patience. Then I sat in the hospital for six weeks. And she had a big hole cut in her back, sacrilegic joint. They went in there. Your, your skeleton's made like this. Your spine goes right up through here, and your skull's up here. Skull up here, spinal column, sacrilegic joint. That's what this is. She has a huge tumor up here at the top of it. It's called a giant cell tumor. It's right over here next to the spinal column where all the nerves go right down through there. They had to go in there and cut that tumor out, cut the bone out. And uh, they said it may come back. It's notorious for coming back. It hadn't come back, though, in 40 years nearly because God told me it wasn't coming back. But I sat in the hospital for six weeks. I wanted to run. I wanted to get out there and run up and down those aisles. I wanted to get out there and do something. But I sat in that hospital for six weeks. That wasn't easy. I learned some things in there. I hadn't been saved but a few months. I got saved in 1973. It wasn't long after that. This came up and uh, went up to Rochester, Minnesota. Took her up there in Mayo Clinic. And they checked her out up there. Said the surgeon down here did a good job. 
and said, uh, but we may have to do if this thing comes back what's called a hind quarter. I thought, oh, Lord, what a horrible thing that is. That's taking your whole leg off, whole side of your body, all that. That was what we faced back then could have happened, see. Never happened. Give him glory tonight. Bless the name. Hallelujah. Glory to God. Never happened. Amen. You can believe I crawled around on my face and buried my face. I did. I said, Lord, God, I'll do whatever you want me to do. Heal my life. God healer. God healer. And he'd already been working on me to preach. I'd been running. I ran here and ran there. Talked to this one about it and talked to that one about it. Tried to find out what I could find out to keep from doing it. <laughs> I did. I didn't want to preach. Last thing in the world, man. I mean, I had a good profession. I had a good trade. Wasn't sick. Anything, you know. But God just kept working on me. Working on me. Where'd that come from? Man, when I got saved, I was a drunk when I got saved. I'm talking about preaching. When she married me, she didn't marry a preacher. But he called me to preach. I had to preach. I said, I'll preach. He said, all right. I said, I'll preach. I'll make a covenant with you right now. I'll preach. I'll preach. All right. That's 40 years ago. Almost. Nearly. 1970. About 74, 75. I forget when it was. I preached my first. Well, the first sermon I preached was the night Jackie. Jackie was born that night, wasn't she? That day. In 75, Jackie was born. That's uh, her daughter, Jackie, Jacqueline. She was born 75. That's the first message I preached at Third Creek, at, at Basswood Baptist Church that night. So I hadn't been long. That's the first message I preached. Preached that night. Jackie was born that day. And uh, it's been a long time, hadn't it? Since 1975, no giant cell tumor hadn't come back. And uh, a lot of doctors thought she'd never be able to walk. And uh, she did. Learn patience. I learned patience. I learned these things that you can't control. That's what you've got to learn about life. There are certain things that I don't care what you do, you cannot control them. See? And when you, gotta, you have to learn to accept the fact, I can't change this. And when you get to that point, then God gives you grace and it builds patience. And my, what you can learn in the school of patience. Boy, you can learn something. God's got to slow us down every once in a while, doesn't he? I mean, yeah, I'm one of those. I like to run. Believe me. I like to run as much as the next fella. Just get busy and bang, I'm gone. But God's got to slow us down. Slow us down. And learn patience. And the trying of your faith is much more precious than of gold. He said in Romans 5, And not only so, but we glory in tribulations also, knowing the tribulation worketh patience, patience experience, experience hope. And hope maketh not ashamed, because the love of God is shed abroad in our hearts by the Holy Ghost which giveth unto us. Hope in never in the Bible is used in the hope of salvation of the soul. It's used in hope of the salvation of the life, yes. It's used in hope of the coming of the Lord Jesus, yes. It's used in the hope for other things, yes. Hope is used in that sense. In the greatest sense that it's used in the New Testament is the hope of the appearing of the Lord. It's called the blessed hope and glorious appearing of our great God and Savior, yes. But no Christian ever hopes to be saved. Salvation is immediate. And it's once and for all. Cannot be added to. Cannot be improved upon. Sanctification improves upon your life, but it does not improve upon your standing with God. Your standing with God is fixed by the finished work of Christ, by the blood that was shed at Calvary. But it does build hope. Patience builds hope. See? Tribulation worketh patience. Patience experience. Experience hope. In other words, you start looking beyond this world. Tribulation worketh a, 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 a view that's greater than earth. Hope. Hope. For a better place and a better day. Amen. 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 God will test us, folks. He'll try us. He won't tempt you. God tempts no man. Father, in Jesus' name, I pray you'd use what I've said tonight. You've been good to me, Lord. You've been very good to me. Glory to God, and you know it. You know it, and you know I know it. And I've told you so many times that you've been good to me. I can shout about that forever. I can run off into the woods and glorify your name. You've been good to me. Lord God, you've been good to me. Father, I pray for those folks who heard me tonight. 
Lord, this faith is not a cheap thing. It's not a contrived thing. And it's not a created thing. Faith is a spiritual thing. It's a wondrous thing that comes down from you. And then God, when you put it in us, you begin to purify it, and strengthen it, and make it greater. Lord God, help us tonight not to fight you, not to resist you, not to skirt from you. But Lord Jesus, let us be in your hands like the potter is to the clay. In thy name we pray, and for Jesus' sake we ask it. When your head is bowed tonight for a minute, would you please bow your head for a minute? Is there anybody in here that would like to raise your hand and say, Preacher, don't you pray for me because I know God has tried my faith and I know God has tried me in ways that I never thought I'd ever be tried. And, and sometimes I go through things that I don't even know how I'm going to make it through it. God bless you. But I've seen God bring me through it. God's been good to me. God bless you. God bless you. You'll always look back and say, Yes, He's been good. And His way's the right way. You will. And the only hell you'll ever know, dear Christian friend, is this earth right here. This is the only hell you'll ever know right here. And you're going to leave it behind. Amen. This world is not my home. I'm just a passing through. My treasures are laid up somewhere beyond the blue. Amen. <laughs> I'm a citizen of a foreign country. My citizenship is in heaven. My life is hid with Christ and God. When Christ, who is my life, shall appear, then shall we appear with Him in glory. Amen. For me to live is Christ and to die is gain. My, you can't beat that. The path of the just is as a shining light that shineth more and more under the perfect day. The sun never goes down for the Christian. It just gets brighter and brighter and brighter till we walk into the light as He is in the light. That's where we're headed. We're headed to the light where there is no darkness at all. Amen. The work of the Holy Spirit is to drive the darkness from your life. Drive the darkness from your mind. Where Satan hides you from the hand of God and from the love of God and from the purpose of God in your life. Satan hides you from that, confounds you with that. But he will not forsake you. Father, in Jesus' name, I thank you for those that raised their hand. Thank you for your word, Lord. I know it's been planted tonight. The seed's been sown. And, Father, maybe all I did tonight was water what some other brother or sister has planted in their heart long ago, long before I ever knew these folk. Maybe some faithful servant of God has witnessed and ministered to them. And all I did tonight was water it. God, we pray, whatever be the case, it doesn't matter with us.